Hi guys, Freddy here with another Retro RPG. And just before I start the video, I would like to offer a correction. A couple of weeks ago I did a review of Cyberpunk Red. And our Talzorian games themselves got in touch about the artwork in the book. When I did my look at the book, I thought it looked like a lot of concept art from the computer game. And while it's really nice artwork, I thought it had a particular look to it. Well, they've been in touch to let me know that none of the artwork except three particular images were by CD Projekt Red. The rest were actually for the book, and that's just the style they were going for. And it is lovely, lovely artwork, so I can't criticise too much for that. But, on to this week, and we've had another poll. And this week, Star Wars Dark Empire has won by a massive amount. It spent much of the week round about the 50% of the vote and ends on 48% um, in our largest poll again. Only by three more votes, but again, the amount of people voting has increased. So, let's go over to the desktop and have a look at that book. So this is the Dark Empire sourcebook. This was released by West End Games in 1993 the year after Dark Empire itself came out. Now, it only covers the first in the stories of the Dark Empire series. It doesn't cover Dark Empire 2, which came out in 1994, or Empire's End, which came out in 1995. And no sourcebook was ever released which covered those two uh, series, even though West End Games kept the Star Wars license right up until 1999. Now, I don't know whether it's because this did get quite bad reviews at the time. Uh, it suffers really badly from what West End Games did a lot of. We'll see a lot of stats in here which are repeated over from other source books. Now, while that is kind of useful for somebody who just picks one or two of the books up so they have the stats that they need, um, West End Games was really, really bad at this because you would keep getting the same stats over and over again. Imperial Star Destroyers, Stormtroopers, etc. would be repeated way over again and again, while useful things, I believe the Lambda Class Shuttle, for example, is in only one source book, the Heir to the Empire book. I think it might have been re reprinted in the Star Wars Trilogy source book, which came out when the special editions came out. But... That was a pretty hard set of stats to find for a very useful vessel because your heroes might be pretending to be in, working for the Empire, so using one of their ships, or be stealing a ship from a base as they try and escape from the Empire. So having the stats for that vessel is pretty handy, whereas Star Destroyers, etc. are just really, really common. Well, let's have a look at the back cover because I've been going on for ages already. And there's no text here. There's just a lovely picture of the cover of the uh, graphic novel, Dark Empire Sourcebook by Michael Allen Horn. They really don't feel any need to tell you anything about the book at all. Which seems a little odd, because I would have thought they'd have wanted to tell you the story of Dark Empire. Um, we've obviously got Palpatine up here, but, you know, mentioning that the storyline's based around Palpatine returning... And let's touch on that, in fact, for a moment. Uh, because Dark Empire does seem to be the prototype for Rise of Skywalker. We've got Emperor Palpatine coming back. We've got Star Destroyers with uh, Death Star super lasers on them, which can destroy planets. It's, again, about trying to turn the hero to the dark side although that's common amongst most Star Wars stories. But so much of Dark Empire does seem to have been wrote, uh, borrowed by Rise of Skywalker. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, following the deaths of Darth Vader and the Emperor and the destruction of the Second Death Star, the Rebel Alliance proclaimed a new Republic over three-fourths of the galaxy. But without the thousands of Jedi Knights who formed the backbone of the Old Republic, the new Confederation was a precarious one. Long years of struggle ensued, during which the Imperial factions consolidated control over a fourth of the galaxy. Whole systems became fortresses, bristling with firepower. Then, five years after the Battle of Endor, the infamous Grand Admiral Thrawn mounted a deft assault, nearly bringing the fledgling Republic to its knees. 
Ultimately, Thrawn was defeated. But within days of Thrawn's downfall, surviving members of the Emperor's ruling council staged a stunning assault on Coruscant, and the vital Imperial system once again fell under Imperial control. It seemed certain that a new empire was about to emerge from the ashes of the old. The very possibility triggered a ferocious war amongst the numerous Imperial factions. Who would sit in the Emperor's throne? Who had the right and the might? Meanwhile, the rebels were quick to seize the opportunity to sow confusion amongst the feuding Imperials, using captured Star Destroyers to conduct hit-and-run sorties into the war zones. During one such mission, Luke Skywalker Jedi Knight learns more of the dark side and its hold over his family. He finds hints of an ominous destiny for him and the children of his sister Leia. An enemy long thought defeated has returned, an individual imbued with all the power of the dark side itself. As long-cherished plans fall into place, New and exotic war machines move against the Republic. A dark empire has arisen. Now that's the text I expected on the back cover. I really expected them to try and sell the story. So when this was shrink-wrapped on the shelf, you can pick it up and see what it's going to be about. Now, this is branded as Star Wars The New Republic because West End Games did try to set its stuff not only during the Galactic Civil War, but also the New Republic era taking it forward into the novels. So we've got the standard introduction, a prologue telling somewhat of the story. Why do we fight? So the declaration of the New Republic, detailing the New Republic itself. We've got Admiral Akbar and his stats once again. Luke Skywalker and updated stats for him as he gains ever more powerful. Force skills control 13 dice plus 1. Sense 11 dice plus 1. Alter 10 dice plus 1. He's getting pretty darn powerful by this point. Leia Organa Solo with her Force skills as she learns to be a Jedi. Now that I do treat as being quite interesting and useful. Han Solo. Haven't we seen Han? Is he really going to be that much different? Chewbacca. Lando. Again, these are just reprints of stats. We have seen these so many times. R2-D2. C-3PO. General Wedge Antilles. Zev Veers. Kane Griggs. Hobo Neva. Sub Snub. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, but I doubt I'm going to insult any Celestans. Mon Mothma. Jandadonna. Crix Medine. These are all characters we have seen a lot of before. Rebel Sea Commandos. They're onto the Empire Reborn. Defeated Endor. The Coming of Thrawn. Mutiny. There's a lot of history in here which really isn't that important to Dark Empire. We're getting a recounting of the stuff of Thrawn. Well, they, that should be in the Thrawn trilogy books. I've got Emperor Palpatine, who is younger and more fighty in this one, but he's not a lot different to he was in the original trilogy books. We've got some new characters here. Imperial Dungeoneers, various um, dark side adepts of Palpatine. We've got the Fringe, because a large part of Dark Empire focuses on Han Solo reaching out to his old smuggling contacts to try and get access to the throne world where Pal the reborn Palpatine set up. And it kind of works for Han Solo. I have to credit Dark Empire on that. While much of the book is very silly, um, as we'll see, the books themselves, or the book itself, really focuses on trumping of technology. So it will introduce a new war droid which can beat walkers, and then there'll be new super walkers which can defeat it and then there will be human brains in tie fighter bodies which can defeat that and then there's world devastators huge factories which churn out uh droid uh star fighters and combat uh, combatants and that trumps that and it's escalation this beats that beats that beats that so at hats and x-wings are way back in the past and virtually useless in comparison but where the story does succeed is introducing these contacts of Han Solo. People who are used to selling the luxuries to Imperial officers that they're used to. So they open holes in Imperial security to let through that smuggling. You know, and it works for the story. 
it makes Han useful, as he often isn't. He's usually just a pilot. Um, the ordeal of Boba Fett. So we've got how he survived the Sarlacc. His battle armor. We've got the bounty hunters. Again, Boba Fett we've seen before. We've got some new ones in here, though. We've got the Force. Well, Dark Empire does introduce a bunch of new Force powers. So we get shown them. We get introduced to Vima Deboda. The Book of Anger. Oh, and some lovely color plates showing some of the artwork from Dark Empire. Most of it done by a countryman of mine, Cam Kennedy. Um, always nice to see somebody from Scotland doing well. And these are quite interesting designs. They're obviously quite different, the images of the World Devastator in the background there. But basically the same. The Reborn Emperor. Wielding a lightsaber. I really didn't like this design of a giant probe droid which could track the beam starships into a cavern uh, hangar on its belly. Just seemed a bit silly. The Eclipse class Star Destroyer. A super star destroyer with a Death Star super laser built into it. We've got Dark Side Adepts, uh, Adepts here. Imperial Sovereign Protectors. Genetically modified. Imperial Guards, who are absolutely massive. They're about 10 foot in height. Then the new Force Powers. Create Force Storms, Force Harmony, Drain Life Essence, Transfer Life. We've got some of the planets. Oh, I'm flipping over multiple pages here. The Deep Core. We've got this. We've got Calamari, where the World Devastators attack. Coruscant, the Syak system, Pinnacle Base, Nahal Hutta and Nashadar, which has become such a massive part of the Star Wars universe, especially in the Expanded Universe books. We've got Starships. We have the Eclipse-class Star Destroyer itself. The Sovereign-class Star Destroyer, which confused the hell out of me, because I do not remember seeing this in the graphic novels. You know, we get the images here of the Eclipse class, the Super class, the Sovereign class, but I do not remember seeing it anywhere in the story. It just seems to be introduced in the source book and then treated as canon to the expanded universe. Maybe I missed it. Perhaps it's somewhere in the background of a picture like this. Task Force Cruisers, Mon Calamari Evacuation Cruisers, the Millennium Falcon, Again, how many times do we need the Millennium Falcon stats? Starlight Intruder, the Hyperspace Marauder. Slave 2, the ship uh, Boba Fett uses when Slave 1 isn't available to him. X-Wings, again. A9 Vigilance, a new type of fighter. E-Wing fighters. Um, TIE D Automated fighters. The Incom I-7 Hellrunners. So there's a bunch of new starfighters in there, which is always nice. And then we've got a chapter on the World Devastators, which are supposed to be the super weapon that is the big enemy in Dark Empire. These are huge factories which float over a planet. Uh, they've got Star Destroyer-like uh, fire, so they can rain down turbo laser fire and destroy enemies. But then they track to beam up all the parts, feed them into their factories, and churn out lots of droid soldiers and droid starfighters. So they're almost like a nanite swarm in that they consume everything to make more of their number. Except they don't create more world devastators, they just create more fighters. And the master control signal, something Luke uses to override them. Silencer 7 and Inquisitor 4, because every World Devastator is supposed to be slightly different. A vehicle section, so we've got V-Wing airspeeders, Imperial patrol vehicles, Storm Skimmer patrol sled, the Century tank, which again has gone on, the TIE tank, a TIE fighter pod with tracks on the side, uh, it doesn't show you it, Hut floaters, amphibians, wave skimmers, which are supposed to be Aquatic at basically, 
Although I have to say they don't really work for me. I much prefer the Atat Swimmer that West End Games themselves developed in one of the adventures. I liked it far more as a submarine version of an Atat and it even kind of looked like one. Whereas these look completely different and I don't see how they work at lower speeds. And we've got equipment here, so Universal Energy Cage, Planetary Shields, Cloning Technology, Hunter Killer Probots, um, Han Solo's Servant Droid, ZZ4Z. And then we've got an advert for The Last Command Sourcebook, coming out in September 1993, the last part of the Thrawn trilogy. So that's the Dark Empire Sourcebook. It's not an essential purchase, um, although it does have... A number of the newer things in it that if you're playing in the New Republic period, so you might want the stats for the E-Wing Starfighter, the V-Wing uh, Airspeeder, things which the New Republic uses commonly. There's so much else which is just repeated. We've got Han Solo again, we've got Millennium Falcon again, we've got R2-D2 again. How many copies do we need? It makes it a less than essential purchase, which is why this got bad reviews back in the day because so much of the book is just uh, reprint, reprinted older material. But I've witted on for quite long enough as usual. Thank you very, very much for watching as always. Please like, subscribe and comment below as it does me massive favours with the YouTube algorithm. But as always, you look after yourselves and I'll catch you later. Bye now.